Good afternoon, Hattiesburg. Thanks for joining us for this COVID-19 and City News Briefing for Thursday, April 15th. Happy Tax Day. Uh, we'll start with today's numbers in the hospital today between both our hospitals. We have 10 people who are COVID positive. Uh, we'll say that Merritt Health Wesley did not have any uh, COVID patients today, so that's a promising sign. Uh, we're, we are getting to about the week or two out from Easter, so we'll kind of see how that affects things. But uh, right now, three of those 10 are in the ICU. And again, getting down to those single digits, low double digits is a good sign for us as we go forward. 410 new cases were reported today statewide with six new deaths. Unfortunately, each county saw a new death, uh, one new death in Forest County on Tuesday, and then one new death in Lamar County on the 11th, which brings totals to 147 COVID-related deaths in Forest County and 84 in Lamar County. New positive cases reported today. Forest County saw eight new cases. Lamar County saw 13, which is up just a bit. And then since this began, 7,537 total infections in Forest County and then 6,132 total infections in Lamar County. Our five-day average, uh, Forest County has dipped a little bit below Lamar County in the, uh, the five-day average. Both are still in single digits. We'll sort of see how the next few days play out. The inside 14-day number, this is the number of people who have received their positive test result in the last two weeks. That number now stands at 48 in Forest County and 74 in Lamar County. So over, overall potential active cases just over 110. Compared to uh, a week ago, Forest County was at 54, they're now at 48. Lamar County, of course, saw that, that jump, um, not too big, but about 15. So we're at 122 now in terms of the inside 14-day between uh, both counties in our metro area. Hospitalizations, we were at 10 last week, we're at 10 again this week. Uh, we are up one uh, ICU patient though. Our goals continue to be protecting the vulnerable, those people over the age of 60, people with underlying or chronic health conditions, preventing overrun of the health care system by slowing the spread and continuing to prioritize public health while allowing the private sector to operate at full capacity. Uh, five factors that we have leaned on, widespread availability of testing, wearing masks, watching our own data, listening to all voices, and then of course in the, in the past few months this, this fifth one, access to and equity in vaccinations. So just some updates in terms of where we are with where our overall vaccination numbers in our metro area. Uh, Forest County has now seen 12,756 people who have gotten both doses of Moderna or Pfizer or the one dose of J&J, &J. so that's 17% of our Forest County population estimated to be fully vaccinated. Another 6% has had one dose, which is 4,580. So 23% uh, are either partially or fully vaccinated now in Forest County. In Lamar County, the numbers are even better. 16,660 have received both doses of Pfizer and Moderna or received the one dose of J&J. &J. So that's 26% of Lamar County's estimated population is now fully vaccinated. And another 8% has received at least one dose. So combined, we're well over 30% now in Lamar County, uh, partially or fully vaccinated. Uh, today, we sat down with Dr. Batson via Zoom and asked him a few questions uh, concerning the recent J&J &J pause on that vaccine, as well as where are we uh, in our community in, in terms of uh, vaccine demand and where do we think we're going in the future. So here's our conversation with Dr. Brian Batson. And we are glad today to have Dr. Brian Batson, uh, CEO of Hattiesburg Clinic, who has led our community's response to COVID uh, throughout this past year plus. And so uh, we wanted to get with him today on just asking a few questions about where we are with vaccinations. Uh, Dr. Batson, obviously this week we found information and, and heard about uh, the CDC and FDA recommending that we pause the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Of course, that's the one-dose vaccine uh, because there had been a, a handful of people who had had blood clots and other adverse reactions. Can you talk about kind of, you know, what went into that decision and, you know, Put it in context compared to other vaccines and maybe when you, we might see J&J &J, uh, vaccine being used again. Sure. Um, yes. On Tuesday, the FDA and CDC released information that suggested that um, there could be a connection possibly between the J&J &J vaccine and a very rare form of blood clots, um, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST, is the uh, other word or term you may have heard to describe this. But in that uh, notification that we received on Tuesday, they were clear that this is a pause to learn more about a possible connection between J&J &J 
and this medical condition. As you mentioned, a blood clot. Um, this is a blood clot that can occur in one of the veins in the, the brain that helps drain blood. Um, but more importantly, it, it's also a potential pattern between this blood clot and an, another thing that they have found in a, a very small number of patients where patients also have been found to have a low platelet account, low platelet count, excuse me. Um, that connection is what really um, raised a flag that needed some additional information uh, to, to be determined. Um, so to put it in context, there have been, at, at the point of them putting a pause on uh, the J&J &J administration, there have been approximately 6.8 million patients who have received a dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And there have been six patients who have been identified to have this connection between the blood clot and the low platelet count. So six patients out of 6.8 million doses given at that point. So very, very rare um, thus far from what we understand. So extremely rare. And in fact, this blood clot uh, that, that we described occurs in the general population as well who haven't been vaccinated. And that's certainly not to dismiss any of this at all, but the general incidence of this blood clot um, is about two, uh, studies vary, two to five patients per million. But again, there's this connection potentially that is being uh, investigated further between the blood clot and the low platelet account. So when CDC and FDA recommended this pause, it was for a couple of reasons. And what we've heard is, is first and, and foremost to evaluate safety to make sure there isn't a connection and to get more information to make sure um, that there's not a connection between the J&J &J and this. But, but secondly, also to allow for the medical community to understand better how to treat this uh, combination of the blood clot and low platelet count. So there were, there were really two pri primary um, reasons for the pause. How long do you think the pause will last? Do you anticipate us getting back to issuing J&J &J vaccines anytime in the next few weeks, next few months? Hard to know at this point. Uh, CDC and, and even the Department of Mississippi Department of Health yesterday gave us very specific instructions on what to do with our vaccines, not to get rid of those vaccines, but to just hold on to them um, without clear indication yet at this point how long this pause could last. Okay, so this is only for the J&J &J vaccine. And, and, and how... What length of time did it take for these folks to get this reaction um, after receiving the J&J &J vaccine? So with these six cases that were identified, all six cases occurred within 13 days of receiving the vaccine. So all, all of these cases were within six to 13 days. All were female and um, were between ages 18 and 38. Uh, those, these six cases that have been identified, and, but all occurred within really the first two weeks of the vaccine administration. So again, this is only the J&J &J vaccine, and it was only at the time that we, that, that we sort of looked at this research, it was six out of 6.8 million had had this reaction. Um, just for, for folks in Hattiesburg, I mean, what, what symptoms should people be looking for? Understanding this is six out of 6.8 million when, when they first made this pause, but but what, uh, what, what sort of symptoms should people be monitoring after they receive their vaccine, whether it's J&J &J or Pfizer and Moderna? Yeah, a good question. Um, so in Mississippi, we learned yesterday from the Department of Health as well that approximately 4,200 doses of J&J &J have been administered to Mississippians. And for those who are past a month of receiving that vaccine, all signs point toward that there's no concern that this might develop. Uh, so if, if past a month, four weeks past getting that vaccine, appears to be out of the window of concern. But for patients who are in that first two weeks after receiving the dose of the vaccine, signs and symptoms to, to watch for would be a severe headache, severe abdominal or leg pain, and or shortness of breath. Now, we all know who've received one of the vaccines. And again, let me be clear that this is just for the J&J &J we're talking about who've received that in the, in the first, in the last two weeks. Um, all of us who've received the vaccine know that there is a chance of flu-like symptoms. These are slightly different. These are a severe headache, abdominal pain, leg pain, and shortness of breath. 
The other thing that CDC and FDA um, have made clear in the last couple of days is that they've looked back as well at the Pfizer and Moderna data to see if there is any pattern um, with this connection of blood clots and low platelets. And there does not appear to be with Pfizer and Moderna at this point. Okay. And, and we've, Hattiesburg Clinic has now administered, I think, close to 25,000, if not more, uh, vaccine doses since, since vaccination efforts began earlier this year. Uh, have, have, has the clinic seen any sort of severe reaction to a vaccine in our community? No, I mean, our numbers have been very similar to the rest of the country, the rest of the world, where those are extremely, extremely rare. We, we've rock, uh, vaccinated over 28,000 at this point and have had essentially zero patients who've had a significant reaction that will require um, uh, you know, hospitalization or anything of the sort beyond uh, some patients having a little bit of a, an anxiety reaction to the vaccine or those expected side effects that we've had with body aches, headache, fatigue that, that some patients have, not all, um, but, but severe reactions. We have been uh, much like the rest of the country where those have not been a problem. So another question that people were asking also, especially those who have received their first and second dose uh, of Pfizer and Moderna, do we know yet how long immunity will last and should we expect that there might be a booster every year that we, so similar to the flu shot going forward? Yes, in, in, um, there's been some recent information come out from both Pfizer and Moderna. I believe Moderna's was yesterday, maybe the day before. Pfizer had indicated a, a few weeks ago that it appeared that immunity was lasting longer than that five months, reaching now six months as those clinical trials have progressed. Moderna confirmed uh, earlier this week that immunity appeared to last at least six months. And again, we're, we're, we're being careful to say it doesn't end at six months, but the clinical trials were only to say definitively that 90% immunity is lasting for at least six months after these vaccines. So continued to get, continuing to get very encouraging news from both Pfizer and Moderna in, in regards to their updated data suggesting that that immunity lasts uh, even longer than initially announced. Um, and then to your second question on booster, Moderna also released information earlier this week that their booster trials were ongoing. Pfizer has said the same uh, with, with some information earlier this week that, that I think was news to me that they were targeting a fall availability for availability this fall if a booster dose were to be needed that that they were aiming for that availability this fall a lot we, we still don't know as far as the need for that booster but you know it as the trials continue and we learn about longer lasting immunity maybe the need for boosters won't be there a lot of that depends too on um, the number of variants that become prevalent in the United States and whether or not a booster would be needed. And looking kind of at, at our local numbers, you know, we've, we've, I think we've achieved over 20% now in Forest County that have received at least one dose and, and many of those have received both doses. In Lamar County, I think we're over 30% now that have received at least one dose. H how are you seeing uh, vaccine acceptance and, and people going to get the vaccine? Have we started to see some, some dip in our demand? Um, kind of how do you see our broader vaccine strategy going locally? Yes, um, as you said, vaccination rate has been uh, over 20% in both Forest and Lamar counties, which is good. Not, not as high as uh, some other areas of the country, and, and I think as a state, Mississippi is Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi only Alabama lags behind us as a statewide. But Forest and Lamar County vaccination rates are, are over 20 percent, which is good, very encouraging. However, um, we have seen a significant drop off in the number of patients wishing to be vaccinated. And that's been over the last two weeks or so, a, a significant drop off, which is very discouraging. We know the vaccines are working. We've seen a drastic decrease in, in the number of positive cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of deaths. Um, but th those, those positive improvements are, are certainly influenced by those patients being vaccinated. So those of us in the community who've been vaccinated have contributed to that success we're seeing. However, unfortunately, as I said, that the demand for vaccines has decreased drastically over the last two weeks, and, and that, that is very discouraging. And, and 
worrying that we will um, not have enough immunity in the community as we reach the fall and these other variants become more prevalent. And thinking through kind of our local data right now, obviously, as you mentioned, we've seen hospitalizations. I think as of today, we only had 10 people uh, in the hospital total with COVID. Uh, but as we enter the second year, we kind of know the, the sort of holidays to watch for and, and what can trigger spikes. And, and Easter just happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've got, you know, Memorial Day, we start to have events again, Live at Five starts this weekend. Uh, going into the summer and fall, do, do, you, do you still think asymptomatic spread and other, other travel will, will continue to bring back cases to our community? And, and, and does that make it even more important and imperative that anyone who is eligible to get a vaccine go and get one? Certainly, um, asymptomatic spread is a thing. We, we've seen that throughout this pandemic that um, it, is, it, is, it is possible it does occur. We are, through the last year, we've learned a lot more about how the virus spreads and, and how it doesn't spread equal, equally so, you know, how it does not spread as easily. CDC gave some encouraging information, uh, um, I believe a week or two ago, about how outside you know, spread outdoors is much less likely than, than originally thought, which that's encouraging it. However, we still know that the most common ways that the virus spreads are with close contact with others when respiratory droplets are, are shared. And so the measures that we've used over the last year will continue to be important. Those that reduce the spread of those respiratory you know, spacing, masks, et cetera, that, that, those are all helpful. And certainly vaccination has proven to be everything we had hoped it would be in regards to its ability to reduce both the, the number of cases and the number of spread as we learn more about the vaccines as well. Um, we all are, are cautious as we look at to the you know look into the fall as new strains emerge and, and what those will bring. But vaccination absolutely uh, continues to be a very important step in in fighting the pandemic. Awesome. Well, Dr. Batson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all your continued efforts and. Uh, appreciate the clinic and Forest General and Merritt Health Wesley and, and Sam Ryan, all of our healthcare providers for what they do. Uh, but again, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks to you for all you're doing as well. And once again, we thank Dr. Batson and all of our healthcare providers for uh, their leadership during this pandemic. Some city news for you today. Uh, paving continued in Ward 4 this week. We finished up College Street by the old Hattiesburg High building, uh, as well as began work on Mimosa Lane. Uh, that will continue into the weekend pending weather. We will also start seeing uh, siren testing beginning Monday, April 19th. I know right now we're starting to see some severe weather. I think we've had several uh, bouts of this in, in recent uh, weeks, uh, but we're going to be testing all six city sirens. Uh, that's East 7th and Main, around William Carey, uh, around Hattiesburg and Cox Streets down in Palmer's Crossing, as well as Tatum Park, Thames, and Classic Drive. So if you hear that on Monday, uh, that's what's going on. Also, for those of you who listen to Mississippi Public Radio, uh, the Gestalt Gardner Felder Rushing will be in Hattiesburg tonight at 5.30 at Chain Park. It's part of his traveling garden party. I know we have a lot of public radio listeners in our community, so if you listen to the Gestalt Gardner, uh, Felder Rushing will be here tonight, Thursday at 5.30 at Chain Park uh, for that event. Also, this weekend starts Lab at 5, we hope, pending weather. Uh, but tomorrow night, the Royal Horses will play. That'll be followed by next Friday with Young Valley. And then, of course, last Friday in April, we'll have the Brassaholics. But I know a lot of folks have missed Live at Five during this pandemic. And so we're glad to have this abbreviated season. Uh, appreciate all Allison and the Downtown Association and everyone involved who has made this possible. Please, when you come out, bring your chair and bring your mask. And finally, our act of courage. Last Friday, we had our annual awards day ceremony for the Hattiesburg Police Department. Uh, we Congratulate our Officer of the Year, Sergeant Jackie Varnado, as well as our Civilian of the Year, Rihanna Clark, from our Animal Control Division. Um, both of these have made such a difference in not only the morale of our police department, but make a difference every day in our community, so we congratulate them. We also want to thank all the runners and all the support staff and sponsors and, and city personnel who helped put on the Hattiesburg Half Marathon. Um, city of Hattiesburg, uh, Pine Belt Foundation, Visit Hattiesburg, all of these groups came together to, to put on a run, which was, again, as we ease back into 
uh, life as we knew it before the pandemic. This was a great step as we saw all these runners from many different states, dozens of states, came to Hattiesburg uh, and put on uh, a great event. So thank you to all the runners and sponsors and, and volunteers who made last Saturday possible. As we continue into the weekend, we're going to wash your hands, take care of yourself, wear a mask if you go out in public. Most of all, be kind. Have a great rest of the evening.